lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I only give sort of one or two public talks a year. And this is it, for better or worse. Um, what we did, Deb and I, was we worked on this speech together, didn't we? You sent me a very clear indication of what you expected from me, and I'm going to try and do my best to deliver it. Um, I was a little bit worried when I found out you'd already been given the sleepy lotion. Um, please don't sniff it until I've finished. Um, well, you could sniff it and you can, we can all blame that. Personally, I don't think entrepreneurs... I've prepared a speech, right? I'm going to move off it and back and forth, but I've prepared one. Um, personally, I don't think entrepreneurs are very well-balanced people. I don't know what the percentage of entrepreneurs are in here, but, um, and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. I think it's a disease. Often when people come up to me and tell me they'd like to be an entrepreneur, I want to tell them, no, you don't. Trust me, you really don't. Because I think to be that driven and to be constantly obsessed is an issue, and it's not a very healthy one. What I'd really like to start with is to explain to you all that while I am an entrepreneur, I'm a technical entrepreneur. So I don't come up with different businesses and then sell them. I just exploit my skills and the skills of those around me to create one sort of business, yeah? In our case, perfumery and cosmetics. And it's always been that for me, with fragrance, always. Um, I don't know why, so please don't ask. Um, I think that someone coined the expression, the entrepreneur's wound, to explain that many entrepreneurs have got something pretty heavy in their background. Um, mine is pretty straightforward. My dad left when I was two, and my mum really didn't feel good about that. I was really brought up by three women, my aunt, my mum, and my nan, all of whom had what is now called abandonment issues. My nan survived both wars and owned a big grocery business in Dorchester until my grandfather died in his 50s, just at the start of World War II. Um, she then had to sell the business. My mum had polio and diphtheria at one stage when she was seven years old. Uh, both times she was in an isolation hospital with nurses peering through the windows at her. Then her feelings of getting a life straight were scuppered when her husband, my dad, left her by the time she was 22. I'm not sure why, but my aunt became an alcoholic, but in a pact she and her husband made, committed suicide. I fell out with my stepfather and ended up being homeless by the age of 16, um, which obviously helped refine my wound. Really, I didn't lift my head up again for 10 years as I sorted myself out. Now, before you all start feeling sorry for me, for me um, I met my wife at 17, um, and I've had a marvellous life that we've built together, so please, it's all right. It was just a bit of a shitty start, that's all it was. Um, so, as I said, entrepreneurs can get very obsessional, and uh, they can be very passionate. And that can manifest itself in many ways, but most typically, they end up with a business that they love, um, that's also worth an awful lot of money, and then they often don't know what to do with it. So I'm suggesting here that it's a psychological profile that drives you on. You then end up with something that you weren't right, quite anticipating, and then you're supposed to do something with that. Yeah? Now, maybe some people in this room will associate with that. Um, maybe they won't. Uh, so where I'm heading here, really, is greed. I'm talking about greed. Um, once you get to that point where you've got enough, now then, there we are. Look at that, it's happening without me. It's happening without me. This is exactly how I like it. Yes, I've been given a clicker, but I really don't know what to do with them. And uh, this is exactly it. Okay, this is a quote from the prophet. It's not dread of thirst when your well is full, the thirst that is unquenchable. Um, Gibran, um, uh, Kael Gibran. I did a program for Radio 4 on Gibran. Um, a sort of hippie tract called The Prophet, which I absolutely love. Um, 
And sort of translated, this, this basically means um, people who store money, when they have plenty, their problem is not money. Well, it might be money, but you see what I mean? If they've got, you've got plenty and you're storing it away, um, where do you go with that? What happens then? Okay. I was going to talk about American entrepreneurs at this stage. I, I don't think in Britain, I don't know, maybe we've got some really fabulously wealthy people in the room um, that are up there in the top ten of the rich list. If we have, I suspect they're not paying their tax. I have worked that bit out about the rich list. <laughs> you don't get up the top if you pay your tax. It's a sort of automatic thing. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to read to you from this book. It's, it's called Devine. It's what I consider to be the best business book. Um, and it's about a, um, an art dealer. He wasn't an art dealer to start with. He was Dutch. His mother had moved to Hull. Um, they then went down to Oxford Street and they opened their own shop selling Delft, blue and white Dutch pottery. And he didn't like that very much. And so he slowly developed the skills to sell art. Now, in those days, nobody sold art. Um, but he, he, had, he opened, in the end, three galleries, one in Italy, one in London, and one in New York. He specialized in selling Renaissance art, so we're talking about before the First World War, Renaissance art to wealthy Americans that didn't know what to do with their money. People like Carnegie, Mellon, and who's the banker? What's the, well, um, what's the bank? What's the bank? Pardon? Morgan, that's it, J.P. Morgan. And these guys approached buying art from him in the same way that they had um, approached everything in their life. So they, they consumed it, and they collected it, and they loved it. And he had this particular skill, which was to never sell it for less than he'd bought it and always put the price up. Mellon, interestingly, um, also lent him the money to buy the art. So he would borrow from Mellon and then sell the art to him. Mellon's bank, anyway. Um, he only ever bought three major collections of art in his life. And they were so large that he constantly had a multi-million debt before the First World War. He would then sell that art over a period of time. Um, and Mellon was one of his best customers. One of the things he did with Mellon was he... Um, he bought the apartment underneath Mellon's apartment in New York. He completely furnished it with beautiful antique furniture. He covered the walls with Renaissance art. He gave Mellon the key and said, use it whenever you wish. Entertain in it, do anything you like. Mellon used it for two, nearly three years, and then he bought the whole thing off him. All the art, all the furniture, the apartment, the whole thing. So a brilliant salesman. Um, I'm very, very exciting. So, Mellon had a problem, which is very contemporary. He hadn't been paying his tax. So he was called up to court, and, uh, and Devine said he'd represent him. So, um, Devine went to court on his behalf. He didn't tell him what he was going to do. Um, and when he got to court, he said that Mellon had been collecting art and he intended to leave it all to the nation on his death. <laughs> which Mellon did, which Carnegie did, which all of them did. So he really set the tone for the modern art collections throughout New York. Because these rich industrialists who really didn't know what to do with their money, I mean, poor old Mellon, he died quite old, and he couldn't see his art in the end, um, before it was, it was gone. So. What I'm trying to illustrate here is a uh, problem of wealthy, and there's no one more wealthy than the Americans, is there? When you think of Bill Gates, interestingly, <laughs> and I'm quoting someone else here, should there be a member of the press, um, it is suggested, alleged, that if Bill Gates had paid his tax, the countries involved would have received the same amount of money that he's been giving away as a philanthropist. It is suggested. 
not by me. The guy that is suggesting it has been saying it for a long time, and no one's sued him. Okay, let me just catch up with myself. You just talk amongst yourself, sniff the sleepy, do whatever you like. I've got to stick to this, because Deb's watching me, and I don't... Okay, we've done Mellon, haven't we? We've done Devine. Okay. Okay. I would just say, I, I really don't mind paying my taxes. Um, I don't know why. I certainly don't go on television and say it, because I might as well write dick on my forehead and sit there, and <laughs> everyone at home can have a laugh at my expense. But I find fiddling around, learning all the ways to avoid it, and then worrying, um, is, it's just not worth the effort. And, on top of that, it confuses so much within the business that no one within the business can work out what's going on anymore because, you know, it's all been done for some other reason. So, I personally like to pay my tax. Um, where are we? Here we go. Oh, yes, here we are. As I said, in my 20s, I was fiercely driven, unhealthily so. Around this time, I had met my first business partner, Liz Weir, a colleague I'd met while freelancing at a local hair salon in Poole. We thought we would uh, start a natural hair and beauty clinic on Poole High Street, and we called it the Herbal Hair and Beauty Clinic. And to just slowly, very surreptitiously get some water and drink it out of three cups at a time. Oh, God. It's not dread of thirst when your well is full. The thirst is unquenchable. Okay. So, yeah, so Liz Bennett and I um, started this business, but we didn't make any money. And uh, so we would have to go out three times a week and talk to either WIs, Women's Institutes, for those that are younger than me, and uh, Towns Women's Girls. We used to get five pounds a go, which I would point out, Deb, is a little bit more than I'm getting today. How much trouble am I going to be in for that one? Shall I read out the instructions that you gave me as well as the speech? or yeah, This with passion and that with something else. Um, interestingly, speaking of entrepreneur's wounds, Liz found her mother dead on the bathroom floor as a young person. Okay, so not making any money, doing this herbal hair and beauty clinic, and then... Um, I saw a little piece in Honey magazine about a shop in Brighton, a uh, single shop that was selling products that I thought they might like to buy some products that we could make. Um, so when I first went to the body shop and met Anita Roddick, it was so exciting. I was completely enthralled by Anita. To start off with, she had this most wonderful shop that was full of everything I had ever dreamt of. It was simple packaging without a lot of expensive boxes, with simple labeling and a variety of sizes available. So kids were having lots of it. Anita was a one-woman whirlwind, full of excitement and energy. She was intuitive and knew exactly what she wanted in her shop. Um, within minutes, I was wrapped around her fingers. Uh, she was lovely and engaged with the customers in the same way. She was over-enthusiastic and probably just as damaged as I was. She was a very, very driven woman. Um, it was at the first meeting she placed an order for £1,200 uh, for our products, which was just amazing as I was so unbelievably broke. She promised to pay me on delivery. Uh, then I got all the credit from the suppliers. I made everything in my tiny box room lab. I didn't drive then. I still don't. I have a lifelong friend, Jeff and Jerry, and we had shared flats and he drove. Um, he hired a white van, um, and then we loaded it up with the order. Mo and Jerry jumped in the back, um, and we took it all over to Brighton. It was then that I met Gordon Roddick. Um, he had just got back from a trip riding a two, from two horses from Buenos Aires to New York. Uh, he was a poet. He wrote short stories and had been published. He was a correspondent for The Observer. When I first spoke to him on the phone, um, he had a stutter, and I sort of imagined him as a fairly sort of nerdy, tiny sort of fellow that was being, you know, overpowered by this wonderful woman. Um, 
And when I met him, he was a six-foot powerhouse. Um, he gave me a check. I paid 50p to have it cleared early and paid off the suppliers. The two of them together were inspiring. They were like the king and queen, and they were really, really lovely. Uh, but I was frightened of them. I might have appeared confident, but, well, I was just so impressed with them. If you did, a, if you did a, like a conference thing, well, they wouldn't, they wouldn't sit in a conference because they just couldn't sit that long, especially Anita, she couldn't sit for more than 15 minutes. Most of the business we did on the tube or walking here or walking there. If we did a conference together, I would go for the day, I would go through all the stuff, learn the things, visit the different speakers, talk to them, do all this stuff. They would come for the last 25 minutes. I'd learn more in the last 25 minutes than I had the whole day. Very, very powerful, dynamic people. Um, it was a marriage made in heaven. As they didn't have any expertise in hair and skin, but a little money, whilst we had plenty of knowledge and no money. Um, so uh, we started to make products for them, and it was then that I started Constantine and Weir with Liz. I don't know if, if there's this problem. Shall I try a clicker? Should we try a clicker? Just sort of point it anywhere. Should we? Oh, there's Liz. Look at that. You impressed, Colette? Use the clicker. She'll have to do them all the time now. Okay, where are we with the story? You're okay or following me? Is it all right? Going okay? Good, good. It's not, you know, about, I don't know, we're about halfway through. Yeah, yeah, about halfway through. Um, okay. So we built a substantial business supplying the body shop with our original ideas. Uh, things like aromatherapy, ice blue shampoo, peppermint foot cream, herbal hair colors, orange cream bath oil. Some of you may remember them. Um, we fell in love with the body shop. We fell in love with all the people, the concept, and we fell in love with Gordon and Anita. In the early years, there were arguments about bottles, discussions on the merits of animal testing. Um, famously, Anita said uh, only people wearing saddles were interested in how their products were tested. Um, whether their products were animal tested or not. Then once the arguments were over, that was it. She stuck to it. So once we had a good old bash through, she was very consistent. Um, those years were great. With our ethics and their drive, we took a headlong gallop with her far out in front. The body shop offered fun, dynamism, and impact. And Anita's reputation as a fearless and challenging businesswoman grew alongside the body shop. The body shop quickly became a phenomenon in the 80s. They were expanding fast, and we, Constantine and Weir, were struggling to keep up with their growing orders. Gordon would call me up and say, and I'm not doing the stutter, here's your Christmas order. I'd go away and make the products, and then a week later he'd call up again and say, here's your Christmas order. And I'd say, no, I've done that. And he'd respond, well, there's, there's a, another. We appear to be very fortunate. And then he found up a third time. Here's your Christmas order. So their business, it was the fastest growing cosmetic business in, in Europe and probably in the world at that time. Um, now, all of you in the room will know that in business, it often seems as if everyone wants to speculate. Well, everyone except for you, that is. Um, playing the financial markets, trading in companies by buying and selling shares. When a company or shareholder wants to raise money, the traditional method is to sell shares to a venture capitalist, a venture capital company, or float on the stock market. This enables outsiders who do not work in the business to bet on the future success of it. When VC companies take a stake, they are only looking for the company to grow in sales. It's a short-term game for high return. They want less money to be given to staff, less to charity, and less to tax. They want more for them, and typically in less than five years, they want out. Not only this, but publicly listed companies have a legal duty to prioritize these goals, maximizing profits for shareholders at any expense. This is business as usual, and it works just fine. Just fine, that is, unless those companies whose shares you're trading have more to them than financial gain. Every now and then, one may have a dream, a spirit, something intangible, which doesn't show in the balance sheets. Anita opened her first shop in, in Brighton in 1976. She marketed it brilliantly, and soon the shop was thriving. By this time, Gordon, her husband, returned from his two-year odyssey of South America. She had famously sold half of the company to Ian McGlynn and used the money to open her second store. McGlynn had a 50% stake 
that was finally worth in the region of £150 million without working a day in the company. Dream on. Money was always short, and so the couple sold franchises. With every two franchises opened, they raised enough money to open a shop of their own. As their needs grew, they would owe us a million pounds, and in no doubt, other suppliers gave them favourable terms. By 1984, tired of the slog, the body shop floated to raise funds. I'm just looking if I'm supposed to press the clicker. It doesn't seem as if I am. <laughs> Gordon Roddick was trying to keep up. On a startup's website, he wrote recently, taking the company public in 1984 was probably the worst move I've made in my life. In making this move, it meant that they were, they were able to pay themselves properly and get some cash out of the business to pay off the mortgage. But going public meant it wasn't about the people anymore. The Roddicks tried about three times to purchase their shares back off the public market, but by that time the price was too high. If they bought them back, it would have crippled the business and created a huge amount of debt. Fast forward 22 years, and sadly, Anita knew she had hepatitis B. And in March 2006, the body shop agreed to a £652 million takeover by French cosmetic giant L'Oreal. And Ethan and Gordon reportedly made 130 million from the sale. Within the year, Anita announced in The Guardian on the 15th of February 2007, I do have cirrhosis of the liver. I could still have a good few years, maybe even decades of life, but it's hard to say. Anita Roddick sadly passed away the following September. Owned by Nestle and Lillian Betancourt, L'Oreal, with a reputation for animal testing, was owned primarily by a company accused of countless ethical shortfalls, including 130 World Health Organization violations. Now, um, I actually have Lillian Betancourt. Lillian Betancourt was the wealthiest, um, the wealthiest woman in France, and she only died very recently. And this is her obituary from the Times. I can press a button, I can press a button. I can press two buttons. Can I? One button. Mark and Anita. Oh, yeah, she was lovely. Lillian Betancourt, not so lovely. <laughs> she was the face on the LNET bottle for the elder people in here. Um, OK. Let's read you. I've written them down here, so I don't actually have to read the fine print. This is just from the obituary, Lillian Betancourt, lady who owns L'Oreal. In 1935, her father founded and became the chief financier of a sinister, virulently anti-communist and anti-Semitic group called La Cagoule, the Cowl, which gained a reputation for gun-running and bombing synagogues. Many of the group's early meetings were held at L'Oreal headquarters, and some of the most prominent figures were later hired as company executives. It was in the company of such dubious characters that Lillian had her upbringing. Among the members of La Cagoule was André Bellancourt, who she fell in love with and married in 1950. After the Second World War, many former members of La Cagoule were anxious to rewrite their pasts, including Bettencourt. He claimed to have joined the French resistance in 1943 and to have served in a cell run by François Mitterrand, who became a lifelong friend. Betancourt would go on to, uh, to serve as a minister in French governments in the 1960s and 70s. He also became a, a L'Oreal vice president and one of the richest men in France in his own right. So Anita's dream died with her, along with the spirit of the body shop. I really did not know or understand that Anita was ill. I tried to buy the business, encouraged by Gordon, but I didn't know about Anita, so I didn't realize why they were trying to sell. I should have known. So I was very critical of the sale and the Roddicks, and then on her death, I wished I hadn't said anything. Um, I found out about four in the afternoon um, of her death, and I was in shock. I didn't know what I thought, so I took the phone off the hook because I didn't want to talk to anyone. 
Then I woke up around four in the morning and wrote a piece about how I felt about Anita. I suppose about my love for her, really. The next day, at 11 a.m., the Telegraph had asked me to write something for her obituary, and so I sent them this. It was an awful shock. I just didn't know. Um, but it did help make sense of why they sold the business. But I still don't think she should have sold out to L'Oreal. Which brings me, with those two stories, to why are we looking at employee ownership? The Roddicks were passionate, and they were passionate about people. This wasn't the ending we expected, and it's not the ending we want for Lush. That's the point I'm trying to make. We loved it so much. I like a happy ending, and that's the thing with the body shop. We were so unhappy with the ending that with Lush, uh, we've been rewriting it. It literally stung, and I was really hurt. I was really cross and very, very critical of Anita. If we hadn't fallen in love with the body shop so fully and completely, um, then we wouldn't have cared. We were still completely smitten, even when we were no longer involved with it. We were still so engaged. As I briefly touched on earlier, we did try and buy the body shop at one stage, but she wanted too much money for it. Um, it was bought in the end, as I said, for 652 million. Um, if the management and staff had uh, tried to buy the business, they would have been able to raise roughly 300 million. That's what the business itself would sort of enable. Um, so if they were to sell to the staff, that's what they would have got, or at least the, their part of that. Um, we tried to raise the funds to buy the body shop, but we could only raise 450 million. So that was the 300 million you could raise off their business, plus the 150 million we could raise off our own. L'Oreal didn't have the problem, so they could beat everyone. Uh, they were in need of an ethical fig leaf, maybe. Um, but the Roddicks should have sold it to the staff. They could have, uh, then it could have remained an ethical beacon on the high street today if they had sold it to the staff. Having competed with the body shop and becoming another company like them, we are not going to make that mistake. They completely missed the point. They sold the body shop to L'Oreal. Who knows what L'Oreal hoped they were buying? I suspect that they were tired of the criticism and wanted to shut the most outspoken critic up. As for the body shop, they lost everything they had worked for and became unethical themselves by selling out to L'Oreal. It comes back to the G word. The Roddicks made more money by selling to L'Oreal. They made a mistake. Interestingly, L'Oreal didn't make the same mistake. They sold it recently for only a little more than um, what they bought it for to a much more ethical company, Natura. So you could argue that L'Oreal actually were better custodians for the body shop than the founders. Lush has always been a transparent business. Most people would describe us as ethical, but how do you define ethics? As, everyone, as everyone's ethics are personal and are different from everyone else's, I think a transparent business is better. It's more interesting. The fact that customers can take a good look into it. I'll tell you why I bank with Triodos. The reason I personally bank with them is because they're transparent. Everything is online. I can see everything they're doing, who they're lending money to, everything. I really like them, and I bank with them all the time, but I never look. I'm just glad they let me, and that's enough. It's nice to have someone you can trust and not have to keep checking up on them all the time. That's why it's good to be a transparent business. At the core of our business are passionate people, or maniacs. Vegetarians, vegans, people who are obsessed about one particular topic or one aspect of their lives. I can advise everyone that if you want to have a business like Lush, you have to employ over-enthusiastic vegans. <laughs> Some of these people we don't even employ. They just turn up every day and they're still there. <laughs> it's these people that make up the success of the business. Every year we run a report done by Ethical Consumer, which is answered by Lush staff. According to the latest report, 91% of our global staff enjoy working for us, 90% are proud to tell people that they work for Lush, and 93% of the staff feel we are the place we place a strong emphasis on ethically sourced ingredients. 
An awful lot of our staff tell us that they're not stressed either. I wonder what we're doing wrong. <laughs> they bloody ought to be. I am. <laughs> at last, we have this conundrum at the moment. Oh, I've got to press another button. Right, I've discontinued the small snow fairy because there wasn't room for all these new naked shower gels. Um, the naked shower gel is the same formula, but it's solid, so you don't have to have a bottle. I was really pleased with this. So I put it all on the shelves for Christmas, and the customers don't seem to be so impressed. So um, now I've got this rather frightening moment while we wait and see what happens, um, and whether they're going to... Uh, to buy all those things or not. <laughs> I think they will. I'm still proud, whether, whether our sales take a dint or not, that we're pointing out to young people, and it is predominantly young people and their dads who buy Snow Fairy, <laughs> that you can have it without a bottle. And it's not soap. It's, it's, soap is alkaline, and it's made in a different way, and it has a different effect on the body. Shower gel is not alkaline, and it's a surfactant, and it has a completely different effect. But it also gets people to ask the question, isn't it soap, which is good, because they've all swapped from soap to liquid soap, and they should never have done it, because liquid soap is, well, I, I can, it's basically a, a preserved system where you pump air through it and challenge the preservative. It's got non-recyclable components. Everything about it is wrong, and everything about a bar of soap is right. So if you learn nothing else from everything I've said today, that's all you have to take away. <laughs> So now I'm having a bit of a quiet Christmas, as I patiently wait for our customers to come round to the idea. Uh, I will have to stand by that. It's a bit nail-biting. Um, OK, I mentioned Jeff and Jerry earlier, the friends that drove the first order over to the body shop. Five years ago, on my 60th birthday, um, Jeffrey had made a present for me. He'd investigated my family tree for my 60th birthday. He's very secretive and had asked me for dinner the night before my birthday. When I arrived, he had three photos from my childhood laid out on the table. Now, as I explained, I had a, quite a difficult childhood and ended up being locked out of home at the age of 16, and I was homeless for a period of time. So now I had no pictures of my childhood, though these three pictures of me aged five, seven, and ten, were astounding. That made me quite frightened, uh, that he might fish something else out that might hurt. Sensing that, he said, don't worry, I haven't got your dad out the back. Although I hadn't known my dad since the age of two, I did still have his name, Constantine, as I never adopted my stepfather's name. And I had, in a moment of wistfulness, made a perfume called Dear John, based on the smell of a jacket he had left behind. I didn't know him or anything about him, but I did have this huge emptiness, this entrepreneur's wound. Jeff had found a long-lost aunt who still lived in my paternal grandmother's house, and my grandmother's handbag was still in the loft, and these pictures were in the bag. Jeffrey had gone and out and met Auntie June. In the loft, they also found an airmail envelope from my father with Pelindaba written on it. Jeffrey knew that Pelindaba was the South... African nuclear establishment based in Johannesburg because he'd been there making industrial films. We met and had our dinner and he told me that he'd found what he found and he told me about my auntie June. Then he asked me if I would like him to look for my father. Well obviously I said yes I would. But I was also worried about rejection. As time passed Jeff followed up the Pelindaba connection. He called up their pension office to see if they had a John Constantine in the records. They did, and my sister Jo still worked there and lived with our father. I should add that he, first of all, couldn't find any record of his death. Anyway, he found him. He also found my sisters, and in case they knew nothing about me, had conversations with them about Auntie June. My father was deaf, so I wasn't able to speak to my Auntie June on the phone. In talking to my sister Jo, Jeff mentioned me, and yes, she did know about me, and yes, she had tried to find me. Interestingly, when Steve Jobs found his father, he really didn't know how to react. Jeff Bezos, the flawed leader of Amazon, dropped his an email when a journalist traced him to a small independent cycle shop. I had once been told, if you ever get a chance to meet your father, you should go right away. So myself, my wife Mo, and my three children got on a plane and we went to South Africa and we met my two wonderful sisters and my dad. 
The first thing he said to me was, wow, you're so confident. Well, I didn't feel very confident. I feel like I feel now. Then he was full of apologies. And I said, no, all's well that ends well. And we talked about how much we'd missed each other. What was sort of impressive for me was that I was 60 and I was weighing up what I was going to do. Was I going to continue to build the business further or what? But in talking to my dad, he had worked for the South African nuclear establishment where they were developing nuclear bombs. During that time, he had become an alcoholic. When he retired at 60, he got himself sorted out, gave up alcohol and started his own business. Do you want me to stop there or shall I carry on? Is that okay? <laughs> he had sorted his life out at the age of 60, which I thought was brilliant. So I came back from my trip fully enthused and started my own life again at 60. So that was the turn point for me. I must admit, wondering if meeting my dad would change me. Would it cure me? But it didn't. It did, however, fill me with hope where there was emptiness before. And to an extent, that enabled me to make this next step. There are seven founders of Lush, my wife. Mo, Rowena Bird, Helen Ambrosen, Liz Weir, Paul Greaves, Andrew Geary and me. Liz has retired and sold her shares to the rest of us. Andrew Geary has left with his, um, and his shares of sale. Carl spoke for the rest of us when he said, there is this horrible, repugnant idea that businesses can be sold along with its staff. Many of our staff have been with us for years, so their life's work is sold with the business. We don't want that for our staff. So what are we doing? Shall I say what we're doing? Or would you, yeah? Um, the majority of Lush's current shareholders are not in favor of ownership passing to the other corporations, venture capitalists, or into public stocks and shares. We share a, a series of fundamental beliefs that ownership of the company should stay private. The fundamental reasons um, behind entering into an employee benefit trust is to protect the business, protect the staff, and give the staff a voice. Through our Employee Benefit Trust, we believe that we can provide staff members with a more formalized voice on important matters such as change in ethics and ownership, and at the same time, um, raise their level of engagement to maintain the business performance in uncertain times. The majority of our shareholders of Lush have agreed a price that the Employee Benefit Trust can buy their shares off them for. It's a set ratio. It's five times the profit after tax of the last three years averaged out. So it's something we've already determined where we have replaced greed with gratitude. So long as they carry on growing the business, we carry on growing the business, uh, they can get more and more money. So there's no lack of motivation. This is the ceiling that enables the mechanics of the business. It means that when we're ready to sell our shares, rather than selling them off to someone else, we want to sell them to the EBT. And that is the lesson we have learned. And the body shop has a new future with a new, its new public Brazilian owners. And finally, I just wanted to say, um, we're not better than Anita and Gordon. We've just been able to learn from their mistakes. Thank you very much.